Uh, my name is Adam Osman. I'm the operations manager and wildlife biologist here at Grand Rack Hunt Club. I'm starting my fifth year here at the property. I started here back in 2012 as a project developing a management plan for the property. And uh, the first time I set foot on this place was to uh, help m map the timber and do a camera census and find out what the place looked like, what the habitat looked like, what the deer herd looked like and, and, and helped to move forward with all that. And, you know, largely learned that Grand Rack was a big swamp with some rock problems and some beaver problems, not a large deer population. And there was a lot that could be done here. And it's been, you know, the last five years have been pretty exciting solving problems and moving forward with all of our management goals. Grand Rack faces several unique challenges, uh, particularly to this property. One of our largest challenges that we had to overcome and quickly was the beaver problem. We hired a local conservation officer that I've known for quite a while, somebody I could just say, here's the keys to the place, take off, go catch beavers for me. And as we you know, remove a colony here or there, we tear out the dams, we help dry things out, and then I can get in, work on infrastructure, dry out my food plots, repair them, grow the right kind of food to grow a better deer herd here. The project that we're on today is more of a courtesy to a neighbor. Part of what we're working on on the property is, is putting up a 52-inch fence all the way around Grand Rack, which is the legal limit that the Wildlife Division will let us do. So we're putting up this 52-inch fence because we have the occasional trespasser problem, or we also work very hard on our coyote population, and we want to put this fence up to help keep some of those out. In building the fence, we found a certain area of the property where the fence line has to go along the property line that's inundated. And it's because of some large beaver dams that are right on the property line, and also some culverts on a road that marks a section of the northern property line. My first trip in here, there was fish swimming down the road ahead of the vehicle as we were touring the property, and that was because there's all kinds of creeks and ditches and waterways throughout this property, partly because of the large wetland reserve project. It just made great beaver habitat, so the beavers took advantage. It dammed everything up, flooded out roads, flooded food plots, and if you're trying to grow you know, food for, for whitetail, the last thing you want are, are geese swimming in your food plots. So we had to do something about the beavers in, in short order. So we want to pull our dams uh, on the line itself. We want to pull the plugs out of those culverts. And it's going to release a ridiculous amount of water, millions of gallons without question. And when that happens, it's going to flow somewhere and it's pointed right at um, a very uh, friendly neighbor. Kelly is going to set some traps. We're going to clean out some of those beaver. They do their work at night most of the time. So if we can get all that rolling in the morning, we'll, we'll really move some water before the beavers have a chance to do anything with it. All right, Kelly, if you will, maybe show me what different type of traps and, and different types of setups you have here. And, you know, if you will, explain to me a bit about how each one of these is going to uh, trap the beaver. Okay. Um, first trap I got here is a full hold trap designed to hold the animal by the, the foot, either the front or the back. And we'll have the trap uh, set up in shallow water and anchored out into deep water, hopefully uh, four or five feet deep water and catch the animal by the foot and they go down into the deep water and uh, it takes care of them real quick. The second style of trap I have is a body grip trap. It's called a 330 uh, bear or body gripper. About eight foot of chain on it. Uh, so hopefully uh, if it's set in a trail, uh, which most of them will be set in trails, um, catch him and he'll roll out of the way and the next one will uh, make it right down the trail. Muskrats swim out underneath, 
right out in front of me out there and there's a ton of muskrats here so that's a consideration as well okay we're on a beaver dam here uh, the beaver are crossing right here so i'm going to knock a small piece out of the the dam with the, my, my hands which is legal get the water flowing over here and the beaver are going to come in here to fix this right away I'm gonna go make some other sets in this pond and when I get done, I'm gonna come back and make sure there hasn't been any sticks or anything that float up into this trap. I'm gonna let this water keep flowing. Other than that, this set's ready to go. Question comes up, how many beaver are in a colony? And there can be anywhere from one to a dozen or, or more would be a lot. You look at, the, the lodges, the size of the lodges, uh, the number of lodges on the pond. This pond actually has two pretty good sized lodges on it. And then the activity on the bank, and I can see on the far bank, there's quite a bit of activity. We know this pond hasn't been trapped for three years. Saw multiple sized tracks on the dam. There's probably six to eight beaver. Morning, Kelly. Morning, Adam. How are you? Good. Good, good. Uh, you ready to see what we've got out here today? Yeah, I think we should have a couple. How many uh, How many traps did you end up setting? I ended up setting six. Six, okay, yep. and that was a mix of leg holds and counter bears? Both, yep. Okay, all right, well hopefully we've got a, got a couple of those caught and we can uh, uh, clear out some dam and uh, move some water. All right, let me get my pack real quick and we'll get going. Yeah. Okay, Adam, it looks like uh, the water stopped where I pulled it out. Looks like we had a beaver come up here and repair the dam. I don't see the trap here, so we should have something on the end here. Fantastic. One of them. Looks like a nice big beaver. This one's been giving you problems for years. To join Gamekeepers, visit GamekeepersClub.com or pick up a magazine at Tractor Supply, Walmart, or Bass Pro Shops. Another challenge that we've faced is just because of the, the geologic location of Grand Rec in northeast lower peninsula of Michigan, it's a, it's a glacial drop zone or dump zone. As glaciers were scooping out the Great Lakes, the rocks would settle to the bottom of these large pieces of ice and basically fall out of the bottom and they were deposited all over this area. So it's a huge challenge trying to do much of anything without destroying equipment, let alone farming. This is a pretty mild field for us as far as rock content. We have to get those rocks out of the way, create as much surface area as possible to grow plants. Uh, at Grand Rack, where we've got a couple hundred acres that we're farming, we had to come up with a, with a mechanical solution that got things done a bit more efficiently for us. So we had to pick up a, um, a rock picker. Obviously, it's a very slow process, but it really cleans it up, you know, grooms your soil, levels things out pretty well uh, for you, and it really helps maximize our farming efforts. Well, the rock problem is something that, you know, no matter how big or small your place might be, whether you're managing a quarter acre of a food plot or 250 acres worth of food plot, you want to maximize the efficiency of every bit of food plot acreage that you can come up with. Removing the rocks is, is just part of maintaining your food plot right along with, with proper soil sampling and seed rates and all the rest of that. So it might only be within your means to go out and pick them up by hand and toss them off the side of the field. That works fantastic. Carry a bucket with you, you know, get them out of the 
away. Have somebody drive the tractor creeping along behind, throw them in the bucket, you know, peel them off. But whatever you're up to, no matter how big or small your place might be, you really need to manage those rocks if that's a problem you have and, and get them out of your way. Trying to develop a healthy deer herd in this part of Michigan, we have lots of little issues in the way. Every place, no matter where you are, has hurdles to overcome. And in northern Michigan, winter is our big one. Winter's the problem. Well, it's not uncommon for us to have 18 inches to two and a half feet of snow in the woods at any one time. It's hard to keep deer fed. And the primary source of food for deer in the winter comes from browse. And preferably for deer health, you want them to be eating young supple shoots uh, at Grand Rack and all over northern Michigan. Maple and aspen make up a huge staple for winter browse. From this timber cut, this is some, some stump sprouts from a maple, and almost every shoot on this maple has been browsed, so you can tell they're really hitting this hard. You have to look a lot closer on these aspen, and there's a lot more aspen out here for the deer to choose from, so the, each individual tree isn't hit quite as hard. But there's browse, particularly, you're always gonna find it at the very end. They're going after that most supple new growth uh, on these trees, something that uh, is digestible, it's much more palatable. So if you're gonna be eating sticks, you may as well eat the ones that are easy to digest. If we've got that two and a half feet of snow on, on that particular day or that particular week, one year old regenerating aspen stand is gonna be above that and it's gonna be you know up a little bit higher even. So even on a small parcel, you can provide long lasting winter food to really help your deer through the winter by having a timber cut every now and again. One of the fundamental aspects being a good gamekeeper, whether it's for white-tailed deer, black bear, turkeys, grouse, is starting with habitat management. Very rarely can you manage wildlife without managing habitat, and for almost every species, and we're focused on whitetail an awful lot here at Grand Rack, so we add a lot of apple trees on almost all of our food plot edges and any place else we can. We're also in bear country, you know, as well, so between bucks wanting to rub antlers and bears wanting to get to fruit, we have to cage all of our trees, and whether you have hogs or bears or or just a, you know, a high buck population that could tear everything up. Putting a heavy duty cage around anything you plant is very important. It's gonna help protect your investment. It's gonna help keep those trees straight and keep them growing tall so you can manage them however you like. For anyone, managing any kind of wildlife, you can easily find out what resources any particular species needs and requires. So white-tailed deer is the easiest and obvious example. If you have a small parcel, look at what all your neighbors have or what the farm has next, you know, next to you. Most of the time, like a farm has a certain crop rotation that they stick with and you can expect one type of crop or another. Look at your small parcel. Provide what your neighbors aren't. Water is often overlooked in wildlife management, whether it's whitetail or birds, you know, whatever you're managing. So think about water where water is convenient to you. Maybe that is the one thing your neighbors don't have for a mile in any direction. You could go out you know, with a backhoe or a shovel if you've got the right geography and elevation and, and just dig a, a simple little water hole. And it works great, it's a water source, hunt over it, use it as an edge or put it in a place that's gonna help funnel deer closer to your stand. All right, so whether you're farming big acreage or small acreage, you have to till your soil up at, at one point or another, obviously, to get, grow a good crop. That doesn't always require a tractor and big farm implements. Sometimes um, all you have available to you is a four-wheeler, maybe a drag harrow. Uh, we're about to go tear up a, about a 20th acre food plot. It's just something that we've built all by hand. Uh, went in with a backpack sprayer, killed a couple of trees so the, the roots wouldn't sprout killed off the existing vegetation, um, but we're just gonna go in with this drag harrow, uh, scuff everything up, and a drag harrow is an excellent implement if you're, especially if you're just planting small seed, like clovers or chicories, or if you're into brassicas, you know, anything like that. So you can disc it up with the prongs down and get your seed down and flip that thing over and just drag it along and it'll cover your seed up just beautifully and you're good to go.
With the harsh winters that we have around here, winter thermal cover becomes uh, vital to our success. The deer can take an awful lot of cold, giving them places where they can get a break from the wind or having conifers that will help keep some of the blanket of snow off the ground where the walking's a little bit easier, and maybe hold a little bit more heat. Those are all very important. We plant a mixture in our thermal cover plantings of various native spruces and pine species, so we have some stand diversity, and we plant them pretty close together, knowing that in a few years, when they get too close as they mature, they're going to try to shoot upward and compete for that sunlight. We're planting them, um, there's, there's no real method. We, we want it to look natural, so most of these are planted in a sporadic manner uh, with mixed species throughout. And because they're, they're, some of them are very tightly packed, that's going to, in the next few years, get us that dense windbreak that we're looking to get. We don't necessarily want them to grow tall. In a lot of these places, we're not trying to develop a future timber stand for revenue. So what we'll end up doing is in a few years when these trees are trying to reach up high, we want them to stay lower and bushier. So we'll probably have to go in and remove a few here and there just so the trees will calm down and they'll stay lower and, and develop these longer branches near the bottom. If you're trying to just plant, you know, some, some thermal cover on a, on a limited budget, you know, and you're looking to get revenue out of it later, you want to be very careful and speak to a forester and talk about your spacing on your planting. Something, you know, like a staggered spacing and, and the proper gap between trees. Something that will help your trees to grow over time and be good healthy trees to where you're not going to have to take anything out before an actual stand rotation or a thinning should happen. That way you're getting the most out of every tree you plant. Be mindful of what species you're going in, what you're trying to accomplish, and, and speak to a local forester about how you can accomplish all your goals with the budget you have available.